Hi everyone, it's Celeste. Welcome to my booktube channel and today I am here to talk to you about what I've been reading lately. I've got about five different things to share with you this week and I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, it's approaching Valentine's Day in February and I've really been enjoying my Jane Austen's Regency World magazine. Sorry if the ring light is shining on that but uh, this is published in Bath in the UK and um, it's a really neat little magazine. I have spoken about it before, I think during Jane Austen July. I had just discovered it at that point and so I had sent away for a bunch of back issues. They are very thin little magazines. They're sort of smaller than the normal size magazine. Um, but they're, you know, they've got lots of fun little articles, things on what it was like when the regiment camped outside of town and uh, archaeology, finding new baths in Bath and uh, movie adaptations of our favorite Jane Austen movies book reviews, all kinds of things, um, lots of social history and things about daily life. So if you are a true Janeite, I recommend this. I think it comes out bi-monthly. Um, and it's not the cheapest magazine in the world, but I think if you're a true Janeite and you love Jane Austen July and love reading the Jane Austen canon, then you would enjoy this. So yeah, that's Jane Austen's Regency World. This is the January and February 2024 issue that I'm holding. And they do have a website online, so you can learn more about it there. And I'll also post it down below. Um, if you click on the more section, underneath the video I always give resources for everything I talk about in my vlogs so yeah Jane Austen's Regency world it's a lot of fun and then I read a short story um, it was recently Edith Wharton's birthday and I love Edith Wharton. I'm a huge Edith Wharton fan. I watched a really good PBS documentary on Edith Wharton's life recently. And as well, uh, I picked up this little uh, Penguin, uh, little black classics edition of two of her short stories. Now the title of this is The Reckoning. That is the second of the two stories. Um, Interestingly, I actually preferred the other story. I originally picked this up because I was thinking about February, Valentine's Day, relationships, romances, marriages, marriages gone wrong, and that led me to The Reckoning. But um, I actually, and that was okay, it was about um, a dysfunctional marriage. It was the longer of the two stories, but the one that I really enjoyed more was um, the first story, which was called Mrs. Manstay's View. And this is a story, uh, I believe it was Edith Wharton's very first published story. It came out in 1891. And um, so it's about a character named Mrs. Manstay. She is an elderly lady. She's a widow. She's uh, estranged from her daughter, who I believe lives maybe in California. Uh, but they don't really communicate very often. They're out of touch. Once in a while, they'll write the perfunctory, uh, you know, ob obligatory letter to each other. But other than that, um, they really aren't in touch. And although Mrs. Um, Manstay has had friends in her life, it's harder and harder as they all get old for them to come up and visit her where she lives. Where she lives is in a back room on the third floor of a boarding house in New York City. And uh, there's a lovely description in here of uh, where she lives. It's in a street where the ash barrels lingered late on the sidewalk. Um, so yeah, Mrs. Manstay is getting older. She suffers from gout and arthritis. Um, she learns from her landlady that the neighbor is planning to build an extension on her house. And um, this becomes a problem for Mrs. Manstay because Mrs. Manstay being housebound, 
being limited to the view out of the back of her uh, room. Um, she, her whole life is sort of centered on being able to people watch and watch the world from a particular window in her home. And um, if the neighbor builds this extension, it will block her view. And the way Edith Wharton describes Mrs. Manstey's view, um, it's so evocative. Um, it's almost like she's painting a painting. It's everything from trash cans and ash cans up close and the edifices and corners of houses and rooftops and church steeples in the distance. And it's like she's painting a painting with words. It's quite lovely. And the story is quite brief. So um, she does an amazing job of that in a very um, uh, concentrated space. Um, so Mrs. Manstey does not want this extension built because it will block her view. And that essentially is her life. So um, the story goes on from there with what Mrs. Manstey decides to do about it. Um, but it's really worth a read, I think, if you're a fan of Edith Wharton, if you're curious to see what her very first short story was. And um, it's a good one. And it, it's, it's just an interesting study of a person's world and the way they view the world and what their space is in that world. Um, and how it's described. So yeah, that was um, Mrs. Manstey's view from The Reckoning. And then the next book that I read was very, very special and extremely heartwarming. I love it. Um, and that is a children's book and it is called All of a Kind Family. It's by Sydney Taylor. Sydney Taylor was a, a woman. And this was first published in 1951. Um, it was published in post-war years, and um, it's just a, the, the best story. Um, it's the story of five sisters, Ella, Henny, Sarah, Charlotte, and Gertie. And the year is 1912. And anyone who watches my channel knows that I really, really enjoy uh, literature which is centered around the turn of the century and the Edwardian period leading into the First World War. Um, so that's precisely when this takes place. So um, the five sisters live in a crowded tenement on the Lower East Side of New York City. They live with their mama and their papa. They are Jewish immigrants and um, papa has a shop near the East River in the basement of an old warehouse and um, he has peddlers bring him scrap metal and rags and things like that which he then resells. Um, the girl's mother stays at home and takes care of the children and does all the cooking and so forth. Um, she sews the clothes that they wear and she often buys a lot of the same material and makes them the same outfits um, and they all wear the same uh, tights or hose and that's why they're known as an all-of-a-kind family because they're all of a kind. Um, this is just oh such a heartwarming gentle book. Um, it's about the girls daily lives growing up in New York City on the Lower East Side and um, yeah it's one of the first books I believe that really documented um, the Jewish experience and the thing I love about it is that it's just full of everyday things. Um, in that sense, it reminds me very much of um, the Little House books. And it also reminds me of the trilogy of books that I had mentioned at Christmas time as being some of my favorites, which are The Golden Name Day and The Little Silver House, that series. Um, in the sense that it just talks about little everyday things and the joys of the mundane. So let's see. 
they go to the library. Um, they have a special holiday where they go to Coney Island. Um, it talks about when they go to the public market and they go shopping for food on market day and all of the peddlers are outside with their push carts and they're all shouting and hawking their wares and there's the pickle man and there's they're selling gefilte fish and they're selling crackers out of barrels and open sacks and um, what else? Um, they go to the penny candy store and all the girls save up their pennies and then they go to the penny candy store and spend time, you know, having fun deciding what penny candies, candies they're going to get. Um, what else? It talks about celebrating um, the Sabbath um, and the preparations for that and the foods that they eat and some of the stores that they go to. The storekeepers speak Yiddish or speak broken English. Um, what it's like to get sick in 1912 when all the girls come down with fever. So um, there's an introduction in this edition uh, by Francine Prose, the writer and critic Francine Prose. And the way she puts it, I have it written down here, um, I think it's perfect. She says, it's a hymn to the ordinary pleasures of everyday life. And that's certainly true. Um, you know, like reading by candlelight and um, oh, just all of that. It's written in a delightful way. Just like the uh, guardians in the Golden Name Day and Ma and Pa in uh, the Little House books, the mother and father in this turn everyday things and even hardships into magic for the children. They make it livable and enjoyable and invest everyday things with meaning. Um, so it's just a really wonderful, wonderful book. And there are several more books in this series. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting the next one. Um, there's All of a Kind Family, More All of a Kind Family, All of a Kind Family Downtown, All of a Kind Family Uptown, and Ella of All of a Kind Family. So I'm looking forward to collecting the whole set. But I do remember this one from when I was younger, and um, it's just a very, very special book. It starts out in November and goes over the course of the holidays into the following year. So. Um, yeah, it would make a great read for November, December, January, February, March, all of that. Um, so yeah, all of a kind family. And then the next book that I read was Clooney Brown by Marjorie Sharp. I love this edition. I love the silhouette on there. And um, in my last vlog, I had talked about a short story I had read from a collection of World War II women's experiences. And um, that had a story in it by Marjorie Sharp, and that kind of got me on a Marjorie Sharp kick. So I decided to read Clooney Brown. It was good, it was very cute, it was funny. Um, it was published in August of 1944, but it's set in pre-war years. It's set in 1938, so on the eve of World War II, and um, talks about Hitler and the coming war and all of that. Um, but even with the grim reality of that, it's just like a very gentle sort of comedy of errors. And um, it's very, what would be a good word to describe it? I think like mirthful. Um, it reminded me, I know it was made into a movie and I have not seen the movie because I definitely wanted to read the book first, but it does remind me of a very gentle, humorous British comedy that might come on at like two in the morning, like a black and white sort of a movie. And it's just kind of um, mirthful and jovial and uh, innocent. And uh, 
It is about Clooney Brown. Clooney Brown is a 20 year old. She is living with her guardian, whose name is Uncle Arne. He's also known as Mr. Pruitt, and he has raised her. And the problem with Clooney Brown, Clooney Brown is 20 years old. She's very tall. She's very independent. She's a very outgoing personality. Um, and she does whatever she pleases. And the complaint from Uncle Arne and the others living around around Clooney Brown is that she does not know her place. Um, and so she does things like she goes to have tea at the Ritz, um, even though it seems to be above her social station. So she does not know her place. And so to uh, give her life lessons and raise her correctly, her uncle sends her to be in service at a country house. And uh, so she goes, well, enter a cast of characters. Um, there is the heir to the manor. There is a beautiful socialite. There is a mysterious Polish professor whose background is kind of mysterious and he's a bit of a ladies man. Whole cast of characters, a mild mannered chemist. Um, and uh, there's little dashes of romance here and there. And Clooney touches the lives of the people she works with and comes into contact with. Um, the only thing I didn't love about it actually was the ending. Um, it was okay, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with it, but um, how can I put it without spoilers? She, there is a person who is important to Clooney at the end of the book who I don't feel like Marjorie Sharp really built up this character enough or convinced me as a reader that this particular character deserved to be what they were at the end of this novel. Um, I was sort of rooting for somebody else. But that being said, so I, the ending I would have tweaked a little bit. It isn't the ending I would have written. But then again, Clooney does what Clooney wants and, uh, you know, she uh, she surprises everybody in the book, so it's not surprising that she also surprises the reader at the end by making a choice maybe some of us wouldn't have made. But in any event, um, it was fun. I would give it like a three out of five stars. Um, I, I liked it. Um, I'm interested to read some more Marjorie Sharp and uh, compare it. Of course, I love all of the Miss Bianca books from childhood. I have a huge stack of the original hardcovers for the Rescuers and Miss Bianca and Salt Mines and In the Orient and all of that. Um, so those would be fun to revisit as well. But yeah, Clooney Brown. And then another book that I've really been enjoying this month is First Ladies of the United States. And this is a book published by the National Portrait Gallery of Washington and Smithsonian Books. This one has been really, really a special read. And it's really, I, I've for a long time have been wanting to embark on kind of a journey where I'm reading about each of the first ladies. And so I decided that this would be a really good sort of general starting place. So this has been a really wonderful launch point. Um, it's beautifully illustrated. It's just what it says. It gives you kind of a little portrait of each of the first ladies, gorgeous, gorgeous um, paintings. And let me hold up this one for you. Um, and among the very first of the first ladies, of course, you have more like um, little portraits like that. Isn't that gorgeous? Um, that is Elizabeth Courtright Monroe. Um, you have tintypes and daguerreotypes. And you also have, like with uh, Abigail Adams, you do have um, a painting, but you also have a silhouette, which I think is just lovely. 
it reminds me in a way of Cranford um, and the silhouettes in the um, uh, TV version of Cranford that starred Judy Dench and she had a silhouette of her love <laughs> um, in the hallway or in her bedroom it might have been but it was um, it reminds me of that very old-fashioned and quaint and all of that um, the interesting thing is the history of these portraits um, how they're commissioned who pays for them um, who actually does the artwork, how that's decided. And um, so it's been really just a wonderful journey. And so what I've been doing is just reading these little uh, mini one to two page biographies and then doing a deeper deep dive, um, trying to find some other books and resources to learn about uh, each of them and I'll continue to do that throughout the year um, some of them are just fascinating for example there should be a movie about this and there I'm sure there are books on the subject but um, Grover Cleveland President Grover Cleveland he was a bachelor and he assumed the presidency in 1885 and he asked his unmarried sister Rose Elizabeth Libby Cleveland to serve as hostess. And although she did her duties well and acted as hostess at the White House, she actually had wanted to be a writer. And she did end up writing several books. Um, apparently, she also began a relationship with another woman, Evangeline Mars Simpson, and she became her life partner um, and they ended up making a home in the village of Bagni de Luca in the Tuscany region and um, then Rose Cleveland succumbed to the Spanish flu um, and apparently letters still exist between them and um, you know there are different sources available about their relationship but um, Wow, and I believe she wrote a book on George Eliot. Just, you know, fascinating little tidbits, fascinating little tidbits. I'm also interested in um, learning more about Abigail Adams. Um, and more recently, like to begin with, I was like, well, who can I really, um, you know, find a biography on that I want to read more about now. And I came to the conclusion that I wanted to read more about um, Mary Todd Lincoln. So here is the little entry on Mary Todd Lincoln. So if you know of a good biography on Mary Todd Lincoln, I'd be very interested in that. Um, she apparently suffered from depression during her life. She endured the loss of her son. Of course, she was married to Abraham Lincoln and um, the Civil War began soon after they entered office. Um, and I know I'm really looking forward to a book which is due to come out in April. It's the new Eric Larson book. Love Eric Larson. I actually had the um, honor of uh, being in a book club discussion with Eric Larson once um, regarding his book Dead Wake and um, I was sort of the unofficial host of the discussion of Dead Wake in the Washington Post book club um, but that's a story for another day but anyway I love Eric Larson's books so he has a new one coming out on the tumultuous first few months of Lincoln's presidency leading into the Civil War. Um, in addition to that, I did come across this book at the library, and wow, what an interesting subject this is. Um, this is one of those little National Geographic, um, sort of like a children's book, um, but really jam-packed with information. And it's Mrs. Lincoln's Dressmaker, The Unlikely Friendship of Elizabeth Keckley and Mary Todd Lincoln. So this is this book. And even though it's a very thin book, it really gives you a lot of information. It's fascinating. So um, Elizabeth Keckley was a slave. Um, 
She suffered uh, great abuse. She was beaten as a slave. Um, she was raped uh, repeatedly and um, she had a son as a result of that whose name was George. Um, but she raised him. She loved him dearly. She tried to stay with him. Slaves were often separated from family members. And um, in any event, uh, her own life story is just incredible. Um, but where she, it intersects with Mary Todd Lincoln is she became a seamstress, a dressmaker, and someone introduced her to Mary Todd Lincoln, and she interviewed for the position of dressmaker at the White House uh, when Lincoln was elected. And Mary Todd Lincoln was looking for someone to make all of her hostess gowns and all of that. Um, Elizabeth Keckley got the job, and um, she and Mary Todd Lincoln developed a friendship of sorts, and um, they maintained their friendship for years and years. And Elizabeth Keckley um, wrote a book, and it's a fascinating book. Um, it's an a autobiography, and it was kind of a tell-all autobiography. And it talks about her being 30 years a slave and four years in the White House. And she talks about the Lincolns and what it was like to work in the White House um, and what sorts of conversations they used to have uh, behind the scenes in private and uh, what it was like when their son died unexpectedly and um, she recounts the morning after Lincoln's assassination coming to the White House to comfort Mary Todd Lincoln and going into the room where everyone was surrounding Lincoln uh, who had by then passed away and she looked at his face and describes it in her journal. It's just an incredible story and an incredible resource and first person account for all of us. I think it's really important to read that. And it's actually available both in book form and also for free online. You can read sections of it and I'll put the link for that down below as well. Um, but you know I love my uh, clothing history and textiles and dressmaking and sort of the feminism of that. Yeah, um, she made some of Mary Todd Lincoln's most famous dresses, some of which are still in existence and are on display in museums. So, and here's just a picture on the back showing the two of them. She was an incredible woman, um, the way that she got her freedom and the way that she created the shop and at one point had, I believe, 20 seamstresses working for her. Um, it's the story of abolitionists and of the Civil War. Her own son, George, unfortunately, he, he had signed up to um, fight for the Union Army and was killed in battle. It's just an amazing, mind-boggling part of our history, and I hope everyone will read about it. And this is a super, super introduction to it. Um, it really will give you a lot of information for such a slim book. And I'm really looking forward to moving on and as the year progresses, not only reading more works from around the world, um, and non-English authors, but also learning more about the First Ladies. I think that's another little goal that I would like to achieve. So if you know of any great First Lady books, please let me know. Um, yeah, so that is it for today. I hope you're all doing really well. It's a very cold gray day out there today. So I think I'm going to uh, snuggle up and have something warm to sip on and uh, continue to read one of my books here. And uh, hope you're doing well. And we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.